Well done. Praise the Lord. Appropriate song for our series we're in. Taking me higher, taking me deeper, taking me farther. Which is, you know, I just believe that if, you're, if you are born again, you've experienced Christ in your life, if you do know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that there is something in you that cries that out. There's just something, even though you may get backslidden, there's still something that says, I wanted to be, I need to be, I must be wherever he is. It's just a crying part. And, and what that ultimately is, is not you and just how good you've gotten. <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit lives, lives in you. And that, that, that plea is that, you know, uh, is coming from, from that deeper inner part of where he's made you alive and where you fellowship with him. Amen? Amen. We've been in this series that is entitled Higher. And today's part three in this series, part one, we dealt with those, those people in Hebrews 11, whom God said he was not ashamed to be called their God. And what was it about their faith, their life, their commitment that, uh, that God said, you know, those are my people. Well done. Last week, we looked at Romans 16. We looked at some of those people in, who were serving in the church there and looked at their names and what, what was being said about them. And what was it that, that drove their lives? What made them so unique? What made them have this kind of honorable mention in, in the book of Romans in chapter 16. And we talked about some of those things. Today, we're going to continue the same theme along. The passage of scripture I want to share with you is found in Psalms, verses 18, chapter 18, verses 31 through 34. It says, who is God but the Lord? Question and answer, all right? And who is a rock except our God? Now catch this. The God who girds me with strength, makes my way blameless, he makes my feet like hinds feet and sets me upon high places. He trains my hands for battle so that my arms can bend the bow of bronze. He's talking about the greatness of God and the majesty of God and there it built in all this and his passion, his plea to walk with God. But then he goes on, we talk about take, taking steps to go higher. He says, the Lord has set my feet upon high places. He said, it, not only has he set me on these high places, He's made my feet like hind's feet. Now, a hind was a small deer, kind of like a, a mountain goat, had those kind of feet so that, you know, if you see these animals, even on what looks like the most vertical kind of mountainside, they just seem to be able to, to climb it, no matter how treacherous, no matter how dangerous, no matter how difficult it is. So here's the thing. He says, you know, God set me up there and then gave me the capacity to live up there. <laughs> God gave me this place, called me to this, and now he's given me what I need to live this. And that's, that's true with our Christian life. I know sometimes that you, you look at the Bible, or you look at some of the sermons that might get preached. Oh, that's hard, that's hard. You're making it hard. Because God, he's, he's made you for this life. He's made you for a deeper walk. He's made you for a richer and a fuller, a more meaningful commitment and, and intimacy with him. And not only has he made you to be that way, he's given you what you need. Hey, he, he trains your hands for battle, he girds your arms up, he makes your feet like hinds feet, all right? So you can walk, no matter how difficult the journey, the pathway might be, you can do it. Because God's made you that and he's, he's called you to that kind of life. So we've been looking at some, in the context of this, this series of messages, I've asked the, these questions each week, so we might as well ask them one more time. And we'll probably ask them a few more times before we get done with the series. Where am I in my walk of faith? Now, I asked you that question last week, and if you tell me you're right where you were last week, I'm going to be disappointed. <laughs> you know? Where, you say, Brother Job had a rough week. Well, this is what we're talking about. You know, your faith is not, is not there just for you to have on Sunday. Where are you in, in your walk with God? And <clears throat> where, are you, you know, where are you headed? Paul said he knew exactly I'm, I'm pursuing Jesus. And I'm pursuing God's goal. Now, I believe that gets, breaks down to some practical goals of our life, where I'm in my, my relationship with my wife, where I'm in my relationship with my finances, where I'm in my relationship to how I spend my time, where my relationship to what I'm doing my job. All those are affecting, you know, where I am. So I think it's good to have some personal things that I'm trusting God to do in my life and believing God for my life. Are there anything, is there anything in your life like that right now? Well, that should be there. Put it down. And then, <clears throat> what's hindering for me heading there right now? Which leads to the lobbyist fourth, you know, what, what's the next step? What's the next step? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> because we're going to deal with some next steps today. Now, I told Kathy, I said on the way over after I preached that sermon, I said, you know, I, I got lots of comments. I just really, this, this wonderful, this, yada, 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 yada. I said, you know, but that was probably the, the most elementary 
of principles that we can talk about. All right? So if you're missing these elementary principles, you've got some work to do. <laughs> you've got some actions to take in your life. But remember, faith without work, if I really believe God, there's, there ought to be some steps to, that are following my life, some actions that are being take, taken and, and, and developed in my life if I'm really trusting the Lord. Where am I going? Where am I headed? What's the next step to take? Well, let's talk about some next step. And, and as I present these four or five basic principles here, I want to start each one of them with a very significant word. Today. 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 Because I can't go back and do anything about yesterday, except perhaps confess where I felt. All right? But I can certainly do something about today. Tomorrow, I, I'll never get there. Because when I get there, it'll be today. Right? <laughs> so, what am I, where, where am I today? You know, where, where's my walk with God today? Where's my walk with God? You know, say, well, I hadn't gone very far. I got out of bed and came to church. Well, that's a good start. But that's not the way the day ends, all right? What are you going to do today? And, and how, how's Jesus applied in my life today? So let's, let's, let's look at these things, and they each build upon the other, all right? Today, if I really want to take it to the next step, I really want to go a step higher, then today I must embrace the cross, all right? That's the starting point for every day. If I want to live, I have to die. So I want to live. Don't you want to live? I want to live life to the fullest. Then Jesus said, come and die, all right? So he says in Romans 6, consider yourself dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Uh, the Amplified Bible puts it this way. Even so, consider yourselves also dead to sin and, and your relationship to it broken. So when I start thinking about going back to something or choosing sin, hey, that, that's relationship's broken. So the devil says, here's what I want you to do. You take your mouth, put it in gear, and stand up for yourself. And you go and say, okay, I will. Say, oh, can't, that's broken. <laughs> can't use it if it's broken, amen? It won't work. It's, it's broken. So if I go back and try to live the old life, it's messed up. It's broken. I have tried it. I've tested it. It fails. Every time I choose to live the arms life, it doesn't work. Why? It didn't work to start with because of sin. But definitely won't work now as a Christian because th that has been severed. I'm alive in Jesus now. I have a new life, a new past, a new future, a new world, brave new horizons out in front of me. I need to live in that life. So I'm considering that old life uh, is dead indeed unto sin. That's, that's it. That's why Paul said, I die daily. That's why we started this out. Today, I'm going to believe what God says, that I, I'm a new person in Christ Jesus, that I've experienced death and resurrection, and so I'm going to, I'm going to embrace the cross. I'm, I'm going to approach this day. You've heard me share this multiple times. One of the simple, stupidest, silliest things I do, I may be stupid and silly to you, but I still do it anyway. In the morning, 85, 90% of the time, when I get up in the morning, my eyes roll open, you know, and I realize this is in the dream. <laughs> I'm alive. I'm awake. It's time to start. Before I even put my feet on the floor, I try to remember, Lord, I, this is your day. I, these feet are getting on this floor. I'm getting out, and they're getting out resurrected feet. I'm, I'm dead to myself. I'm going to live for you today. Amen. Now, sometimes I fall flat on my face in getting out, <laughs> spiritually speaking. Sometimes I get through half through the day pretty good, and I realize I need to get back to the cross. It's, 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 I've, I've departed somewhere. But it's the simple step. This will transform your life. You know? I am dead indeed into sin. The, he went on in Romans to make it even more simple. He says, hey, you know, not only are you dead to sin, it's no longer your master. So you do not have to do the things you would. Those things you used to do, you don't have to do them. So when Satan says, you got to do this, say, no, no. It's broken. <laughs> I don't have to go to there. But Brother Joe, that's just the way I am. No, that's the way you were. You am something new. You are in Christ. You're a new creature. And until you get this down, and we talked about this in the last two messages in regard to our identities, beginning to realize who we are and what God's done in our life. So a simple step is, if there's steps to be taken in my life, the first one is to the cross. I get to the cross. I claim my death. I realize that I'm in Christ. I'm not myself anymore. I'm in Jesus. And I understand that this whole thing about Christianity, simply put, is a, it's, it's, it's a transfer. I transferred the arms life to Jesus, and guess what? He transferred the Jesus life to me. We exchange lives. And you know who got the bad end of that deal. <laughs> Amen. I exchanged, this, that's my first, you know, the core problem with living 
as a Christian, it's not all this sin out here. That's not my problem. And dealing with all these temptations. The biggest problem I face is me. All right, the biggest problem you face is not me. It's you. That's your biggest problem. It's you. you. You get past yourself. Man, a whole new world opens up. You get past your self-life, your self-living, your self-ways, and realize it's Jesus first, last, center, all, all the way from start to finish. It's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's amazing what, what God does. If, if you get our e-blast, you, you notice this last uh, Wednesday, I put a little quote in there from George Mueller. George Mueller was a great man of faith. In fact, there's several books written about this, this man's life and his, his testimony. I mean, he cared for tens of thousands of orphans and day schools and started Bible classes and Bible studies all over the world. You know, over 150,000 children went through those orphanages. Uh, uh, I mean, he circulated thousands of books and tracts and gospel tracts. Three million books were, were, were in circulation that from George Mueller's pen. I mean, just amazing man of God. The latter part of his life, someone asked him, you know, how did this, you know, all these great things, what happened? Here, here was a quote I shared in the e-blast. He said, there was a day when I died, utterly died to George Mueller. His opinion his preference, his taste, and his will. Died to the approval or blame even of my brethren and friends. And since then, I have studied only to show myself approved to God. Powerful words, simple truth, yet profound truth. That today, can I die to what people think about me? Today, can I just be what God's called me to be? Today, can I die to the opinions of the world and say, I'm going to choose to be what God's called me to be? I love the way the Apostle Paul put in Ephesians 4. He says, you know, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, that you may be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and the holiness of truth. What's he saying? Take off the garment of yourself and put on the garment of Jesus. And it's literally the terminology he's like just taking off something and putting something else on. I take off Job, put on Jesus. Amen. He looks better, he fits good. <laughs> looks good from both sides. Amen. Just putting on Christ. And I think it's getting to the point in our life where we say, I am willing to pray the Gethsemane prayer in my life, in my situation. Not my will be done, but thine. Not my will, but thine. Where does that start? It starts today. Today. Second part of this is surrender. Today, surrender to the Holy Spirit. If we're going to go deeper with God, if we're going to go higher with God, then it daily means, I, I believe, radical adjustments to the Holy Spirit who lives in us and to his will for our lives. And it, 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 the best word I can come up with here is Surrender. And there's this two-step process. It's so simple. One is confess anything in your life that's hindering the Holy Spirit from working, which is sin. Any sin that's in your life. And number two, begin today to claim the filling of the God Spirit in your life. Now, according to Romans 8, I believe firmly that once you are saved, you become a new creation in Christ. And if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. That when you're saved, you're born of the Spirit. It's a spiritual birth, right? So I have received this transforming work and what makes me saved is the presence of Jesus in my life, the power of the Holy Spirit working in my life. He's present in my life. That's, that's, I'm indwelt, all right? I have Christ in me, the hope of glory, the Bible says. Your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God. And your body and your spirit, which are God's, they're not yours, all right? So today I surrender to that. But along with that, I, I seek and claim and confess his filling in my life. Now, Ephesians gives us a great illustration about being filled with the Spirit. We've preached on it many times. You know, it talks about don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And, and the correlation has to do with, with the words of being drunk and, and being filled. Th those two words. If I am drunk with something, I'm controlled by something, right? That's why they call it driving under the influence. You know, driving while intoxicated. Uh, it, it's affecting my judgment. The very first thing that alcohol does in the mind is immediately affect the center of reasoning and judgment in the mind. I mean, scientists tell you this. You know, you don't have to be a, you know, a rocket scientist to figure that. If you, if you ever got drunk, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I won't ask for a show of hands. All right? It affects the way I think. It affects the way I speak, the way I act, what I do. But what happens when the Holy Spirit comes and I allow him to influence me instead of alcohol or the world or myself or other things or people? 
I allow the Holy Spirit to be the influencing factor, then I am acting different, living different, moving different. I ask the Holy Spirit and I begin my day today. Fill me with your spirit. Control my life. Influence my decisions, my judgment, my thinking. And it, it, you say, well, it can't be that simple. <laughs> yes, it is that simple. Why is it not that simple? Well, it's got to be something else. Why? Isn't it amazing? That's why Paul wrote the church. Be not removed from the simplicity that's found in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Don't make this thing hard. It's not hard. All right. If there's a dumb moment, it's not with God, it's with us. It's just, hey, this is what Jesus said in Luke 19. He said, listen, if you have a child and he should ask you for bread, you're not going to give him a stone. He said, and if you have a child and he should ask you for, you know, some food or drink, you're not going to give him a scorpion. He said, now, if you, being evil, I'm sure that went over real well, know how to give your children good gifts, don't you think your heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to anyone who asks him? So you ask, he said, and then you knock and you seek. If you ask, it shall be given. If you knock, it will be open to you. If you seek, you'll find. So take time. If I say, I really need to take the next level, you're not going to get there by yourself. And you're not going to get there by sheer determination. And you're not going to get there by saying, I'm going to pull my bootstraps up and make bigger at this and better at this. You watch me, God, I'm going to do this for you. Yeah, he's watching you fall right on your face before you even get out of the start. No, I need the Holy Spirit. I can't be, I can't do, I can't act, I can't say the right things, I can't do the right things unless the Holy Spirit fills my heart and life. Jesus said in John 15, without me you can do nothing. Pretty simple. So today, go to the cross. Today, be filled with the Spirit. Today, three, number three is today, commit to the Word of God. Now, don't wait for me this passage. This is kind of a, uh, an Awana theme verse in, in many ways for our children's ministry. But he says there, you know, you know it, it, listen, from childhood you've known the sacred writings which are able to give you a wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every, every good work. That we might be equipped, we might not be ashamed workmen, that we might be godly people. God has given us something. He's given us what? The book. And if, I, if I, this book is not important to me and it's not a part of my daily life, it's not a part of my daily commitment, hey, then I'm going to fail completely. I'm going to mess it up completely. I remember hearing the story about the, the great preacher Gypsy Smith. Someone came to him and said, uh, Brother Gypsy, I've read the Bible through several times and I just can't get any inspiration from it. I just don't know what's wrong. I've been through it several times. To which he responded, just let it go through you once and you'll never be the same. You'll tell a different story. Therein lies the difference. I, you know, I, I, there's a lot of people say, well, Brother Joe, you know, I read the Bible. But they don't really read the Bible. They proof text it. You know, speed read it. Here's my Bible verse for the day. Oh, thou blessed, wonderful servant of God. Thank you, Jesus. I got a verse. That's the way they read it for a verse. Now, I've always advocated reading Proverbs and Psalms, but some people, that's just, I'm going to read Proverbs today. Oh, there's a verse. Got my verse for the day. It, there's no interaction with the Word of God. Hey, what's he say here in, in, in 2 Timothy when he's talking to the church in, verse, in chapter 3? He says, it is profitable for doctrine. What's that mean? He shows you what you're supposed to believe. How do I know what to believe if I'm not in the Word of God? Well, I go to church on Sunday. Well, then you know what I believe. <laughs> what do you believe? That's why when you get in a situation with some Jehovah Witness or Seventh-day Adventist or any other kind of another weird thing on the edge out here, or you get involved with some kind of theology that's just really, you don't know what to say, you don't know what to do, you don't know what to believe. I guess that's right. Because you don't read the Word of God. Profitable reproof, he says. What's reproof? The Bible will show you what you're not supposed to believe. <laughs> not tell you what to believe, it'll tell you what not to believe. It's pretty clear what you ought not to believe. It makes it very clear. And there's a lot of things people believe they shouldn't believe. And if they just read the Bible, they wouldn't believe it. Well, I believe what the Bible says, cleanliness next to godliness. Yeah. 
Just like where your mother said, clean your room or you're going to die and go to hell. I don't know. <laughs> correction. It's good for correction. What's that mean? It shows us not only what we shouldn't believe and what we should do, it tells us what we should do. How we are to behave. What we're to believe. He said it's profitable for righteousness. What's that mean? It means how we ought to live our lives. How we all respond to the right, righteousness of God in us and correct our lives and make the adjustments and, and let his righteousness pour in our life. In fact, I took this word read, all right, and I, I made up a little acrostic because, you know, I like acrostic stuff, you know. Read, R-E-A-D, right? What's that spell? Read. read. It spells it backwards, forwards, up and down. Yeah, okay, maybe it says the other day air, but all right. Read. I mean, it's just the four simple words to help you understand what it means to read your Bible. First of all, read it, all right? That's habitually, all right? That means you ought to read your Bible every day. You ought, to, you ought to just take the time to steadily, persistently interact with the Word of God. When Paul came and preached to the Bereans, they checked it out with the Bible. So he said, it said, you know, the Bereans, they were those people who searched the Scriptures daily. That's not proof texting. They're not looking for a nugget or looking for a little promise, you know? Little, it's, it's, it, I know it's the culture. Everybody wants a little bite-sized nibble. A little something I can nibble on, it just satisfies the, that's never going to give you any deep satisfaction. And it's never going to give you the satisfaction, the wisdom, and these take you to another level in your life. You need more than just a verse for this and a verse for that. You need to know God, and this is what it's all about, which leads me to the second one. You read it habitually, but you read it to enjoy it. This whole issue of the Word of God is that I might know Him. That I might fellowship. He reveals himself to me. He shows me what he's like. This is the way I can spend time with him and know who he is and what he's all about and what's going on and, and, and get a grip on who he is in my life. It's here. This is a living book. God walks these pages. He's just waiting for me to open up and visit. And he can speak to me by his word. So I read it. To enjoy it. I, and there's really two ways that you're really going to get the most enjoyment out of it besides just read. One is you start memorizing it. Transform my life. I was so messed up when I got saved. You know, I, I, it just, I mean really messed up. Some of you think I'm weird now. You, you, you'd appreciate the advancements. <laughs> <laughs> messed up, strung out, you know, bad habits, you know, bad language, drugs, the booze, whatever, you know. My, my day started off with, you know, a, a Coors beer or Bud Light getting out of the refrigerator and head for work, you know. And then, then by the, before I got to work, I'd, I'd smoke half a joint, you know, and then at least. And then at lunch, it was a repeat that. On, you know, it, it, on the way home, it was the same thing. It, you know, I was like that guy you know, most of y'all drive to work with every morning, you know. You're dodging him every morning. <laughs> Get out of here, you know. <laughs> What broke those chains of bondage was the power of the Word of God. Memorizing the Word of God. If you have a stronghold in your life, you can't break it, the Word of God will break it. Amen. The strongholds are in the mind. Jesus said, you are clean through the words which I have spoken to you. If you have a ha bad habit in some area of your life, get your Bible out, get your concordance out. You know one of the first things I did in scripture memory? I got out my concordance and I started looking up in the New Testament all the verses that had the word body in it, B-O-D-Y. Because that seems to be where I was having most of my problems, right here. And I started writing out scriptures on three by five cards, writing out scriptures that had body in it. Your body is not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Romans 12, present your body a living sacrifice. And I just started writing out these cards. And I'd take those cards and I'd put them on the dashboard. Or I'd put them in my pocket, all right? This is why I quit smoking. All right? I love to smoke. Some of you smokers, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you ex-smokers, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You know? I love to smoke. Don't look at me like that. And when, when I laid cigarettes down, it wasn't because I wanted to. Some people, well, I just need to quit for health reasons. Well, that's noble. I didn't want to quit for any reason. <laughs> Other than God said, get rid of that in your life. Get rid of that. That's, that's a bad testimony. Get rid of that. 
And so every time I wanted a cigarette, I'd smoke a Bible verse. Not literally, okay? <laughs> You're rolling Bible verses up. <laughs> Send him to Colorado. <laughs> Some of y'all get that later. <laughs> just, you know, and just start memorizing the script. Whatever it is, I, I challenge you. If you have a problem with lust or with bitterness, whatever, go to the Word of God. Let those scriptures get in you and go through you, and it will change you. Man, Jesus said, this is the power, you know. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, he said, your prayers will be answered. You'll ask What's in your heart and it'll come to pass because what will be in your heart is the Word of God You begin to ask according to the will of God Because you're in the word. You can't pray effectively if you don't know the Bible How do you know how to what to approach God with if you don't know the Bible so quit sitting around having that ABC sermons, you know Y'all you know, you know what the ABC is don't you? That's what I loved about first grade was the complimentary gum under the desk. That's what I'm talking about, you know <laughs> Already been chewed People do that every Sunday. They come in and they listen to a sermon. Hey, I've been chewing on this all week. I wish I had time to give you everything God gave me out of this. But I've been chewing on this all week long. And I've been enjoying it. But, I, you know, I've just about got everything going to get out of it for me. You better get, better get on it yourself. Get with God. Go to the cross today. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. Read it. But not just memorize it. Meditate on it. I mean, that's like the old, that's that word we know comes from a cow chewing its cud. That's literally where that terminology comes from, meditation. You know, a cow, they eat the grass, the hay, whatever, and they chew on it. Like some of y'all during the service watching you chewing your gum. <laughs> and when you get under conviction, it slows down. <laughs> <laughs> We're having way too much fun. I'll make you Meditation, where it's just, you know, it goes down, it comes up, you chew on it some more, it goes down, goes to that first stomach, you spit it up, cow sets down the shade and chews on it some more. Then swallows it, later on, fix it up again, chews on some more. Soaking it, milking it, getting from it everything you can. And if you take scripture and memorize it with a meditation mode attached to it, it'll blow your mind, my God will do in your heart. Those strongholds of your mind will begin to collapse. And you'll begin to think like Jesus. The mind of Christ. It's only going to be found in the Word of God. So you read it, but also you, you ask. And this kind of goes back to the point number two about asking the Holy Spirit. You're asking for assistance. When you sit down to read the Bible, everything in the world is going to go through your mind you've got to do in the house. I've got to get up, got to go to this. You no, know, Lord, I need to get focused here. When I read this, this, if this is a spiritual book, then I need your Holy Spirit to translate this to me. All right? And I've told God many times, duh. Huh? You ever have the huh moments in the Bible? You know, huh? <laughs> but you read it until you get it, and the Holy Spirit gives you illumination. Now, you know, I, I am blessed to have grandchildren. You know, they're more fun than real children. <laughs> can I, grandparents can bear witness with that, right? Not that you understand. Bear with me. Now, the only thing about having grandchildren is they come with a son-in-law. <laughs> Y'all don't let him have this tape, please. <laughs> now, I got a great guy for a son. I mean, Todd, he's a blessing. He's a jewel. He's an Aggie. We forgave him for that. But, you know, he's a great guy. And he's an engineer. I mean, smart guy. But when it comes to basic tools, he'll get his thumb stuck in a screwdriver. <laughs> he's just... He's, you know, he'll, he, and he knows it. He'll call me up, you know. He called me, he texted me yesterday. I got a brand new Ryobi. Volt, volt, 18 volt saw and drill. I said, yeah, but do you know what to do with it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he'll put LOL, you know. So he calls me up, as usual, when he has something to put together. Last Christmas, it was a swing set from Walmart. 14,000 pieces, you know. This week, it's a trampoline. Sixth birthday, trampoline. So, we go over there, and there's a thousand pieces. Now, I'm pretty handy with tools, but, you know, some of you make fun of directions, but I praise God for directions. <laughs> Especially in moments like that, you know. Real men don't read directions. Yeah, but us dumb ones do. All right. <laughs> <laughs> And not only that, it was good, it had pictures. 
because when the Chinese translate the instructions to English, there's a, it leaves a lot to be desired. You know what I'm talking about? You know, some, what does that mean? Put part A with the something, 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 something. What was that? So they have pictures, they have pictures of the parts. Everything's laid out. So we could read the instructions. So we're laying it all out, and Todd's going to throw the instructions aside. No, 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 no. Bring the instructions back over. Well, you're Mr. Toolman. You don't need instructions. Hey, give me the directions. Hey, I may be a preacher, but I still need the book. I need the instru- I'd be saved 30, 40, 50 years. You're going to still need the book. You never get any place in your spiritual life where you don't need the Bible and where you don't need to read the Bible. It has to be a practice of your life. Get in the book, stay with the book, and yes, the trampoline got put together. Thank God for instructions. So you asked for understanding and you also asked for strength. Wisdom and strength. But isn't that what he said in, in, when we read from Psalms a while ago? You know, he gives me the strength. He gives me what. But if you don't ask, you don't receive. We just finished that with James. You know, you ask not. Because, you have not because you ask not. And it's just extremely important because of the, the value of this book and the importance that God places upon his word that we have the spiritual wisdom and the spiritual understanding and the spiritual strength because it's not giving it to us as suggestions. It's not God's ten suggestions. It's commandments. It's his will to be fulfilled as well as a revelation of himself. And so I need the power of the Holy Spirit working in my life. So that's why we go back to that, that step too. But even when I'm reading it, I'm asking for grace and direction. Third part about read is depend on it. Fourth part, depend. Say, so what do you mean depend? Well, there's three ways. One is I trust it. If God said he has set me on higher places and made my feet like hinds feet, then I don't have any cause to complain about where I'm at or what I'm having to deal with or where I'm going through. I can trust God. God said, hey, I am equipping you for this journey. I'm making sure you have what you need to climb this mountain, to to traverse whatever avenue you're in, whatever path you may be going. I'm going to give you what you need. But I I need, I'm going to come to the place, well, I believe that. I believe that. Any progress you're going to make in your spiritual life, let's go back to this issue of, do I believe God? Remember when we said those, those people, part one of the series, they, God was not ashamed to be called their God because they believed it. That's true. It's kind of like going back to the Holy Spirit issue. Ask and receive. Okay, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. You don't say, okay, now. Now, I'm waiting. Any moment, be good. I guess he did. What are you waiting for? Well, aren't I supposed to feel something? There's anything about feeling anything. It says feel, F-I-L-L, not F-E-E-L. <laughs> All right? I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Anything to do with feeling the Holy Spirit. There's sometimes we feel something. There's times we don't feel something. But we always must believe God. And God said it. That kind of resolves the issue, doesn't it? So I trust it. But also obey it. If I do trust, then that, that's one side. The obedience is the other side of the same coin. That's that faith in action we've been talking about for weeks. God said it, that settles it, do okay, okay, God said, I'm filled, thank you, Jesus. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I have what God said he'd give me, I just trust him for it. But third part of that element is then, then there's the using it. You say, what do you mean use it? Once I've read the word of God, it's equipping me, what? Fully equipped to be the man of God, fully equipped to be the woman of God. But now I need to use the equipment. And part of the equipment is the word of God. So, well, how does that work? Well, it's just like I was talking about with strongholds in your life. Put it to work. Memorize it. Meditate. What happens? The strongholds begin to be destroyed in your life. What's happening? You're using the Word of God. I'll face a temptation today, same as Jesus in the wilderness. Tempted three times. Three times he says, it is written. Just quote the Word of God. What did Paul say? He said, you're sword in this fight. You only get one offensive weapon you only need one offensive weapon and it's a sword which is the it's the word of god so when you're in battle you don't leave your sword in the sheath and oh it's so hard god things are so bad you just don't know what's going on and they did this and she said that and he did this and my boss was this way and you know it's just hard pastor living his life You pull your sword. It is written. If 
I'm facing despair or depression or anxiety or situation in my family, my children, my life, my finances, I tell you, there's nothing you're going to deal with. Not that God hasn't dealt with it here. This is complete, fully equipped for everything you ever need in living righteous life. But you won't know what it is. You don't even know how to pull it if you don't have it in your heart, in your life. David the psalmist says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not send it against God. In other words, I have it here. I can use it here. I don't have to pull out my iPhone and look for a verse. <laughs> Amen. I got the word in me. I have the power of God in me. I have what I need from God in me. Then use the sword. And whatever it is that's in your life, that's an issue in your life, that's where you draw the sword. To use it means to confess it, to claim it, to plead it, to speak it. See, the devil can't read your mind. Some of you think he can, but he can't. He's not omniscient. He can put thoughts in your mind. And you can sit in your mind and say, I was just a devil. I was just, you say, you're, you're a liar. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. He didn't hear that. But if you pull your sword and say, in the name of Jesus, by the authority God's given me in his word, I rebuke you. You get out of my house. You get off my kids. You get away from my husband, my wife. In Jesus' name. You invoke your authority. You speak your authority. You claim. The Bible says this. And you claim it. And you stand on it. And you believe it. And then you see what God does in the supernatural sense of your life. The fourth is this. Today find your place in the body of Christ. Don't you love this passage? And it's just one of many places where the psalmist is writing. saying, you know, I just love being in God's house. He said, I just, I just, I love the word of God. I love the presence of God. How blessed are those who dwell in the house of God. All right. You say, well, Brother Joe, he's talking about, you know, the, the tabernacle. He, he later on says, God's not, he doesn't dwell in temples made with, in the courts made with man's hand. God is here in our midst. We are the living body of Christ. We are referred to in Scripture as also, not just as individually, but corporately, we're also referred to as the temple of God. How lovely and how blessed are those who are here today in the house of God with the people of God, praising God. A day in the courts with God's people, surrounded by God's presence, is better than a thousand outside this place. I would rather stand and tend the door for God's people and live in the tents of wickedness. Amen. What's he saying? It's a good thing, come church. Right. What do we say? Sunday is fun day. <laughs> it is fun day. I love being with you guys. I love watching you guys love being together. I love watching the fellowship. I love watching the body in action. I love watching people realize that, hey, it's not just about me. Hey, I'm here with, for other people and with other people doing what God's called me to do. I found my place in the body of Christ. I'm going to serve God here. There's another passage in Hebrew that, where he's given this warning. He says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Why? Because we need each other. All those scriptures in the New Testament of one another. In fact, you can't even, you know, really actively have the fruit of the Spirit operate in your life. It talks about in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. You can't have that operate in your life without relationships with other people. You can't do it by yourself. You can't live the Christian life by yourself. It's about a relationship with God, about a relationship with you, with me, even with the lost. We have responsibilities. We have relationships that we're living with. He says, so here's what he said. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And you know what most people think of that? They think, that means I stayed at home I didn't go to church today. No. Well, yeah, you're over there by yourself. How's that going? Well, they don't have to put up with anybody. <laughs> Maybe they don't have to put up with you. <laughs> That's not what God called you to, is it? No. But here's the idea. When you, and if, you, if you'll take this, and those who like to do word studies and stuff, look at this word in the Greek language of forsaking. It literally means to abandon somebody and leave them vulnerable. You have left your brothers and your sisters vulnerable when you're not there. So we don't think of that to do with others. But the whole Christian life is about others. Spiritual maturity is about others. We don't think that. Spiritual maturity is about me. I understand this theology, and I've got some doctrines. I understand soteriology. You all know what that is, right? 
the study of salvation. I know what it means and how to be saved in theology. I understand the doctrine of salvation. I understand the doctrine of heaven and hell and the justice of God. I understand, hey, I believe in the security of the believer and all this information. I understand the reason behind the, the writing of the book of Colossians. Paul wrote the Colossians church because, well, they were the major tradition of the world, yada, 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 yada. All this information, you got notebooks. You've gone to all the Bible studies. You didn't miss the men's study. You didn't miss the ladies' Bible study. You didn't miss that Bible. You went to the retreat. You got all this stuff. And you think you're mature, but you're still living this little independent life that doesn't take others in the body of Christ or others in the world into account. You're not mature. Maturity is not about you reaching a certain level. It's not inward. When we're mature, it means we become more outward. Upward. All right? It's not about the info. Paul said, all that information, that's good. But it just puffs up. And he used that terminology about yeast, you know, in Scripture. Leaven is the word. You know what leaven is? It's yeast. You know what yeast does? You put it in dough and it causes, it, it gets hot. And what happens is it begins to get warm and hot. It creates a, a reaction, a chemical reaction, which releases a gas. And it causes it to bread to rise. Basically, Paul said, you guys are just full of hot air. You're all gassy. <laughs> we got some gassy Christians, don't we? They're full of hot. They got some information, but little transformation. That's right. They have no patience with other people, no patience with, you know, it's just, just, you know, I don't put up with that. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to put people in their place. And I'm going to tell them what I think. That's not maturity. Hey, today, realize I'm in the body of Christ. I need to find out where I am supposed to be serving him in the body. What am I supposed to be doing here? Which leads me to the last point. So glad you asked. No, you're saying, get to the last point. <laughs> Today, tell somebody about Jesus. You know, you can't be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ without being an evangelist. Come and I will make you what? Fishers of men. You can't be an evangelist without being a disciple. Now, here's his conversation I've had over years from evangelism even to pastoring. It goes like this. Here's me. We need to reach more people for Christ. We need to win more souls, guys. You need to be more active in your, in your personal witness. Here's, here's, here's the response. Pastor, that's true, but, you know, the, the, so many of the churches are so mature. And we need to make disciples. And we need to have some maturity in the body of Christ. And we need to grow some people up, you know, and, and teach them some things and, so they can be mature, so they can be disciples. No. When you get saved, you're a disciple. And what disciples do is they make more disciples. Maturing process is a natural flow of us doing those for earlier things. We talked about walking with Jesus, learning the Holy Spirit, identifying your life at the cross, you know, getting in the Word of God, <laughs> finding my place in the body of Christ, all right? And what flows out of that, you know, is evangelism. So we can say we're mature, but if we're not telling about Jesus, we're not mature. We can say we're disciples of Christ, but if we're not telling anybody about Jesus, we're not discipling. The whole idea about making disciples is, 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 is part of what disciples do. We, we make disciples. We, we are disciples, we make disciples. It's, you know, like kind produces like kind. I, I win people to Jesus because I, I am of Jesus. I, somebody led me to Christ, I'm going to lead somebody else to Jesus, and they'll lead somebody else to Jesus, and we'll reach the world for Jesus. But you can't exclude this issue. So many people want to cut this out. Well, you know, Pastor, if we just focus on evangelism and we spend some money, we're going to up all these new Christians and they're just, you know, that brings in a lot of big mess in the church. Spend all your time counseling. <laughs> Glad they didn't say that about me or you when we got saved. I were a mess. I praise God I had a patient pastor who just accepted my mess. Come on in. The water's fine. And taught me it doesn't stop there. It's about reaching people for Christ and the kingdom of God's called us to go, go, go. Christian maturity, let me say it again, has never been about you. Christian maturity is always about not how awesome you are, not how well you're doing compared to other people, not how smart you are, not how holy you become, but it's about Jesus and it's about others. That's what maturity is about, if we're really going to be mature. Follow me. I was sharing, Phil and Stacey and I were eating 
dinner the other night and Kathy and uh, I was talking about something the Lord just just going through my heart and mind was about the way the Lord deals with people and the way he de- brings us in. You know, it's, it's like Jesus and John the Baptist, you know, he baptized me, John, he baptized him. And then later on, he turns to his disciples and says, follow, follow him. John tells them to follow Jesus. Jesus looks around here, they come in and they said, they, well, yada, yada, yada. And Jesus said, hey, come and see. Come and see. Philip and Andrew talking about it. You know, hey, you wouldn't believe it. I think I found the Christ, the Messiah, the Messiah. You got to come see. And he says, and Jesus says, all right, come see. Every one of us start right there. Come and see. But when you follow the gospel through, it doesn't stop with come and see. But we have churches in this generation of Christianity in this part of the world that are filled with come and see people. They want to come and see. They want to come and see the song, the service, the preaching. You know, they want to come see each other. They want to come see, you know. But it doesn't stop with come and see. A little later on, Jesus talks about, you know, make your fishers men. A little later on, he's, he's, he's kind of like, click, 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 click on the dob, turn, keeps turning it up, getting to the point. Come and see. Hey, follow me. So now we come and see, now we come and follow. And as we come and see, we come and follow, then he goes to stuff like, hey, uh, if any man's going to follow me, let him deny himself, take up the cross and follow me. Uh, if any man's going to be my disciple, he must obey my word. If any man, and it starts, all this stuff starts coming out, what it really means to be a disciple. The knob's kind of turned up. Heat's going click, 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 click. Finally, he turns around the crowd and says, hey. They were coming and seeing. This was the come and see crowd. He says, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have any part of me. Peter said, Lord, that's some tough stuff you're saying. Now, I believe, I've heard preachers say, well, he's talking about cannibals. I believe these Jewish people understood the concept of covenants and covenant relationships and all that. So they understood that what we see in the, is the memorial covenant meal. They understand he's talking about you have to take my life. You be a part of me, then you have to accept me fully for who I am, which is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. And it says, and many left. The come and see Jericho crowd was gone. They cut out. Hasta la vista, baby. Lenny shared scripture out of 1 John this, this last Wednesday night. As you know, said, hey, they went out from us, but they were not of us. They, they were the come and see folks. Are you a come and see person? Here's where he gets to. Come and die. And the invitation to call a believer's fellowship is always come and die. Because that's where you find life. That's where joy begins. That's where victory begins. That's where life begins. When you come and die, then you find life. Now, when you come and die, don't stop. There's another click. Go tell. <laughs> Go tell, come and see, come and follow, come and die. Ultimately, that's the call to our lives anyway. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up the cross, and follow me. Now, let you consider that one more time. Where am I? Where am I headed? What's, where's, God, where's God taking me to in whatever situation you may be facing? Because this comes in lots of, it's kind of like the facets of a diamond. You know, there's lots of, a lot of different ways that God's dealing with our life and working in our hearts and life. What's he doing? Where's he taking you in that? Maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's in your finances. Maybe it's in your home. Maybe it's with your children. Maybe it's on your job. Maybe it's in your attitude. Maybe it's in relationships. Maybe it's in being used by God. Whatever it is, your spiritual gifts, your place in the body of Christ. Where are you in all that? And what, what are you going to do? What's the next steps to take? Well, I think simply put, making first these choices on a daily basis will give you clarity in every other area if you're willing to listen to God. Choices have to be made. William James said, when you, don't have, to, when you have to make a choice and you don't make it, that is in itself a choice. And my brother met the Lord about a year before I did. He used to come over and ask me, hey, you need to give your life to Jesus and talk to me, preach to me, and you know, things like that. you need to make a decision. I said, I'm not going to. Get out of here. Leave me alone. No, you, you're going to make a decision. I said, I'm not going to make a decision. Said, well, you just made one. Right. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. <laughs> you're not making a choice as a choice. You said no to Jesus. You thought I was obnoxious. <laughs> what kind of choice are you going to make today? What's, what's the Lord put his hand on as a man, or as a woman, as a young person in your life today? Was it what, and I believe with all my heart, 
you know, just when the Bible talks about the body ministry in 1 Corinthians, it talks about to one's given the word of faith, another's given the word of healing. God, God operates in so many ways when his word and when his people get together. So that what God says to me may be something different than what he said to you or somebody else across the room. But God said something to you today. What is it? What are you going to do about it? You want to go higher? And respond in faith. It's not about doing things. It's about moving towards Christ, loving Jesus. Heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. It's all about intimacy with Christ. And letting him pour his life in us, but through us as well. Would you stand with your heads bowed today?